Okay, um, I don't have the patience to wait for that countdown, and I'm so eager to get into it with the one and only Professor Dara Lee. So let me let me formally introduce you and welcome you, Daryl, to the program and to our audience. Welcome to the inaugural episode of the Transnational Times podcast. This series seeks to spotlight the activist proxies intellectual engagements, historical continuities, and abundant possibilities of transnational solidarities today. The podcast will feature activists on the ground, as well as scholars, public intellectuals, and journalists committed to the practice and or study of transnationalism. We're delighted, so delighted, to welcome author, professor, lawyer, and dear friend, Dara Lee, as our first guest to discuss his new and remarkable book, the Universal Enemy, Jihad Empire and the Challenge of Solidarity. The book is an ethnography of Mujahideen in Bosnia involved in supporting Bosnian independence during the breakup of the former Yugoslav Republic in the mid-1990s. Daryl's study involves a few dozen interlocutors spanning 11 countries in at least four languages, according to my count. But you can tell me otherwise, Daryl. The result is an extraordinary and unprecedented work. And I mean that when I was describing it to somebody earlier today, they said, well, what did you think of the book? I said, in, my, in the nerdiest possible way, and honestly, I can tell you that it is, it is sui generis and unlike anything um, else out there, let alone of what I have read. The book tells us a different story about universalism, mobility, solidarity, racialization, sovereignty, and certainly about Muslim transnational identities in the context of American empire. At the most shallow level, the universal enemy is also a corrective to the U.S. and uh, European terrorism industries, um, and specifically the self-appointed terrorism experts who have become an entrenched pillar of the endless and nebulous global war on terror. Um, Daryl has a few snarky remarks about them as well as a few other things, which we'll, <laughs> I'm going to let you share, Daryl, and I'll also share with our audience as we continue. But let's begin by discussing your book broadly. You're a person of broad intellectual curiosity and expertise. In fact, I first virtually meet you over the phone as a recent law graduate from as a recent law graduate when you were in Gaza or had just left Gaza. Later, I meet you as a practicing attorney, and now I've become reacquainted with you as an anthropologist. Um, and so I, I'm really curious to, to understand, given this vastness, how you end up to uh, on the doorsteps of this study um, in Bosnia and, and really transnationally, um, how did this project come to be and then develop and take on a life of its own before it arrived to all of us in this form? Um, well, first of all, thank you so much, Noura, for having me on. I'm honored to be here. I'm honored to be a friend of the pod, a, a friend of the JAD, as it were. Um, and also, um, huge congratulations for your promotion to a uh, tenured associate professor at Rutgers. That is amazing news. And um, it's good news, not just for you, but for many of us out there. Um, so uh, 
you know, this book, um, in a way, it's kind of like a retrospective, um, I would even say an obituary, but that's too optimistic of the, the past two decades, actually quarter century of world politics. It's kind of an account of the rise and fall of a particular phase of American empire, right? Not American empire altogether, but it's sort of strange post-Cold War and then post 9-11 moment. Um, and I came into it because that was just the world that I sort of um, grew up in and stepped into as kind of a politically um, sentient person. So I, um, I was actually in, in Gaza on 9-11. And I remember um, very vividly watching the first um, media images of the uh, captives being taken from Afghanistan and elsewhere to Guantanamo Bay and very quickly realizing that uh, the world, the professional world that I was in at the time, which was kind of like this human rightsy NGO humanitarian world, um, didn't really have a vocabulary for talking about or even for making sense of um, what was going on with the war on terror generally. And um, as I kind of moved into academia, I realized this wasn't just a problem in the NGO world, it was also a problem in academic Middle East studies. Um, you know, it's kind of amazing, to be honest, that the, the, the figure that, is, that the book is about, right, the kind of transnational foreign fighter, jihadist, whatever, um, has been at the heart of so much of the public attention and, you know, uh, stereotyping and anxiety and fear mongering about the region. Um, but there's been actually so little um, work on it, even within kind of like critical Middle Eastern studies. Um, beyond a very generic kind of like uh, pushback on on Islamophobia. Um, and we can talk a little bit more about some of the value and also some of the limitations of, of those critiques. Um, so really the the book, the project just started with me sort of thinking to myself, um, you know, who are these people? And as I got involved in legal work, uh, defending captives being held at Guantanamo, um, I realized that, you know, the histories that brought people to a place like Afghanistan, right, especially Arabs, people who were seen as, you know, what I call Muslims out of place, right, because the United States had this idea that, that a non-Afghan Muslim in Afghanistan on 9-11 was, you know, presumptively, uh, you know, a part of Al-Qaeda, right, and that those people were the ones who needed to go to Guantanamo or other places. So just trying to make sense of that kind of mobility, um, to talk about these people as more than victims of human rights abuses was sort of um, the puzzle that got uh, that got me started on the research. And also because there were there were questions around how to think about these people that I didn't have political answers to either, right? Because transnational jihad movements are not, you know, they're not really like legible as as left, you know, uh, sort of you know revolutionary projects either, right? Right. So, you know, I think that was also a part of a lot of the confusion, even in a lot of the critical discourse. So, um, you know, so I had a strong kind of uh, political sensibility in terms of opposing the war on terror and opposing U.S. imperialism, but also a lot of uh, just analytical curiosity and not knowing answers. Right. And I think that in a way is um, sometimes more fun and more rewarding as a research project. Right. When you don't necessarily know what it is you're going to end up with. Um, so that's how I got started on the research. And that was uh, 15 years before this book came out. So it's been, uh, it's been a pretty long road and I'm, I'm so excited to be able to talk about it with you today. I can't hear you. Hmm. I was just saying that that's phenomenal and it's not surprising that it took 15 years. You're obviously, you know, the journey that you take us on specifically temporally span something from 1990 to the present in itself, right? Because, and then, but before, historically, you're taking us as far back as, you know, the non-aligned movement and another universalism um, that also, help, also helps us think about um, the racialization that you track in the book. But let's, let's, let's ground this, right? Let's ground this for our audience and thinking about who are your interlocutors. So obviously you have an archive of over 200 <laughs> different um, um, people and characters that play out, but you, you focus on a few dozen, a few of them, you know, become people that, that we see throughout the book um, and actually develop some sort of 
affinity with, you you have just as as method, you have uh, a way that you're introducing us to them, which I found so refreshing, not as your objects of study, right? Which is, you know, unless you're a participant observer doing ethnography, either you're part of them or you're looking at them and what you do, you're not a part of them, but you're not looking at them either. You're letting them, you know, speak for yourself. And I can sense that you had a friendship. Um, and, and part of that that develops is also uh, another part that's really unique about your book is that you introduce yourself in, to them in many cases and earn their trust as an attorney on their behalf. And so that's what brings you to describe this as, um, what is it, an anthropology of law and ethnographic lawyering. So, I mean, that in and of itself is unique. So tell, t- tell us about... Why? You know, one, is this, is there precedent to doing this? Sorry for that legal drop. But is this, um, has this been done before to approach your ethnography as an attorney on their behalf? How does it earn the trust? And how then do you, how, how are you balancing, you know, your clients and your caseload uh, together with uh, what you're collecting in your ethnographic work? Yeah, so, um yeah, so just to back up a little bit, um, you know, for those who may not be familiar with the book, um, one of the things about it that I think is um, different is that uh, there's like a crazy number of books reportedly about jihad, jihadism, whatever. Um, very, very few of them are based on any kind of um, solid empirical research, um, and very few are based on, on interviews with people who actually fought, you know, in these conflicts. Um, I, but, you know, this is not the only book that does that. Um, so I think what makes it a little bit different, even from the books that do have some interview material, is that uh, a lot of these interlocutors are folks I uh, I was able to uh, talk to and kind of follow their own sort of lives and struggles uh, over a number of years and a great many conversations. Um, and we can talk a little bit more about why that's the case and some of the legal problems that, that these former um, sort of had fighters um, experienced. Um, but yes, as you said, um, I um, I had a kind of professional identity and repertoire as a lawyer that kind of enabled the research to happen in the way that it did. Um, so when I started the research, I was kind of trying to get away from that kind of human rightsy world, you know, as I had mentioned earlier, and just try to approach these people as a researcher. And I realized, as one often does in the context of, you know, so-called field work, um, I realized that these people had really no reason to trust me. Um, they were, of course, you know, they had one eye over their shoulder, right, be looking for the CIA coming to kidnap them. And uh, they were very reluctant. And I realized with time that um, one of the few resources that I had that could be potentially useful to them was my kind of um, experience, um, you know, in the sort of legal human rights world. Um, but then it raised this other problem, which is that I couldn't, you know, I, I wasn't there to be their lawyer or to represent them, right? And I don't know how to make it work, right? To, to write about someone with some sort of critical distance and also to represent them as an attorney. I don't, I don't really think that can be squared. Um, so what I did instead was to sort of figure out how I could leverage my legal skills in a way that could be useful to them, but without kind of taking on the responsibilities of that attorney-client relationship. Mm. Um, So what I did was I found opportunities to kind of advocate um, on the policies that were affecting them. So in Bosnia, I mean, with the war on terror, the US, of course, basically tried to turn the entire world into into a battlefield, um, but in different ways. And in Bosnia, what the US did was they put enormous pressure on the government to, uh, to denationalize and detain and deport uh, the relatively small number of um, veterans of the jihad who stayed on. Um, so with those folks, uh, you know, there were all of these new, new laws that were passed, making it possible to strip them of their Bosnian citizenship without trial, to detain them on the basis of secret evidence. Um, so it was possible for me to get involved in legal advocacy on those issues without having to take a position on the details of their individual cases, right? Like, did this person do this or not do that or whatever? Um, So again, I think it was just a way of trying to think creatively about all the different uh, spaces within the law that you can kind of 
carve out to do some of this research, but also to be aware of the different um, sort of ethical and methodological trade-offs that come with that. So for me, ethnographic lawyering is kind of just having um, this sort of mindset of, of a litigator, right, and in, in, in trying to identify like the, the gaps that you can sort of exploit, the loopholes you can sort of work around, um, and then to make the research, you know, to kind of, you know, help uh, build a foundation of some kind for the research there. So it's really interesting because you, this, this is also insight into the drafting of the book, which is the fact that you're coming in at a moment when um, many of these former fighters are being stripped of their nationality and hunted down in the context of the global war on terror. You actually begin, you know, at the immigration center, you end in, in, in how this is ravaging lives, right? And so, but, but the book doesn't do that, right? You're not, it's not refracted through the global war on terror. In fact, it's on its own terms. You begin in the war um, in Bosnia and the breakup of Yugoslavia. And I, I, so this is why I find this so interesting that they become part of a framework of the war on terror and those that are hunted down, but that was not, they're not part of this constellation, right? According to them and according to what you tell us, right? They are, they are traveling to Bosnia for their own reasons from many different places from, you know, and, and, you know, there's the Arabs, but there's also the Arabs that are coming from Europe. And this is a story you're telling us about jihad and mobility, right? The image that we get is that there's in, if we look at it through the global war on terror is that it's this, network of Salafi, right, Arab Muslims who are all traveling and following, you know, where they can fight their next war, except this precedes that episode, right? And, and you're showing us that even just even through the circuits of, of migration, that it disrupts this understanding of, you know, states as either sending states or receiving states, but instead, it, it's much more fluid. And, and one way that you, you demonstrate that fluidity to us is on, on the jihadist own term as well, which is this concept of ansar, right? So why don't we, why don't we just start there of, um, you know, obviously this is referring to a historical Islamic reference of, of those who um, welcome uh, the prophet to Medina. And so they're, they're seen as helpers, which disrupts this idea of, of even geographically of even understanding, right, mobility. So can we start there about um, this concept of insad and the formulation of the katiba that is actually not an antagonistic relationship to whatever, you know, the embryonic sovereignty of Bosnia or its army? Yeah, okay. Um, we just covered a lot of ground there. <laughs> so, um, uh, for folks who may not be familiar with the book, you know, what, what I did not want to do was to um, write another book that kind of takes the top down, uh, essentially imperial view. Um, and there are books that do that in the way that you mentioned, Nura, that sort of, you know, th where the, the lens of like the counterterrorism specialist and tries to find these networks. Um, but even uh, a lot of critical work that tries to push back on the war on terror is also, you know, kind of big picture, right? It kind of looks through the same lens as the empire, but just tries to do it in a way that is sort of pushing back on what's going on. Um, and while that's certainly very valuable, um, I wanted to do sort of what my um, doctoral advisor, Eng Sang Ho, called uh, taking the view from the other boat, right? So not the sort of view from nowhere of, you know, how the empire looks at the world and not even kind of like what's happening in a local place that is experiencing imperial power directly. Um, the view from the other boat is sort of the perspective of people who are, who are not kind of hegemonic, but who are also mobile, right? So the Arabs that I talk about who fought in Bosnia are in this weird place, right? They're not, they're not native to Bosnia, right? That's sort of the whole point. Um, they're not part of uh, the US empire. So they don't readily fit into a lot of our assumptions about you know, good universalism or bad universalism, right? Or like the empire pushing back on the, on the, on the peripheries. Um, but in order, to, in order to make that argument work, um, yeah, it was necessary to kind of build out 
a sense of the richness of their sort of transnational worlds, right? Like we've been talking for a long time about the limitations of the nation state as a framework, kaza kaza, and that's all completely true. But it's one thing to do that, and it's another to um, find a way to um, to sketch kind of an alternative way of looking at the world. And what the sort of transnational jihad formations that I'm trying to, to write about here, um, they're able to do this through reference to all of this sort of rich repertoire of tropes, institutional forms, patterns of debate, and so on that are broadly and very, very crudely kind of denominated as Islamic, right? So yes, as you mentioned, the category of, of Ansar is an extremely important way of doing that. Um, so uh, through this kind of imperial or nation state kind of framing, um, we get this idea that these are foreign fighters, right? And the question you'll find in a lot of the debates is, you know, why would a person, why would a Muslim from country A travel thousands of miles to country B to sacrifice themselves in the war? They must be crazy. Um, that's pathological. Or, or if you if you celebrate them, you can say, you know, wow, mashallah, like that's extremely altruistic, right? Um, in in both of these perspectives, there is kind of this mm -hmm. of this you know, baseline, baseline idea that, that, that you know that, the way you fight, the way you fight, the way you fight is part of the national army. National army. Right. right. Um, and, and so, so the whole idea of idea of foreign fighters, fighters so, you know, raises the raises the of of the nation's nation as kind of as fault with the base. Um, um, so talking about, so talking about Ansar, Ansar is uh, is a way to tap into something that's much more historically rooted, um, but that naturalizes mobility. Right. So it's not like a weird thing that you're doing. It's yeah, the Ansar were people who. But the it, for, so this you know trope going back to the early history of Islam is that Prophet Muhammad um, peace be upon him you know and his followers you know were the emigrants who traveled to to um, to Medina and the and the partisans who helped them um, not only welcomed them but then some of them went off to fight alongside him right so both the emigrants and the partisans are people who move so it's not your nation state framing of here's some local people, here's some foreign people who show up um, and like, let's look at the craziness that happens. But to say, actually, um, what if mobility becomes the baseline, right? What if it's the immigrants who are the normies, right? And 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 others who are the weirdos, as it were. Um, and to kind of think with that, you you can start building a kind of analysis um, that yes, as you, as you said earlier, you know, um, gives a sense of the world that these folks inhabited. And then once that gets sketched out, to then reapproach um, familiar structures like the war on terror from like a fresh perspective, right? So rather than just sort of accepting the terms of the war on terror and trying to find critical space within it, the book tries to um, develop this kind of alternative framework and then to kind of bring in, um, you know, empire, or peacekeeping or these sort of institutional formations that you know have been studied so extensively already but hopefully to do so in a way that sheds a uh, different light on them so i know this is not what you want to do and that what your what your work is trying to disrupt um but i think it would be really helpful because you're right i mean your book doesn't do this either it doesn't provide a history of the breakup of the former republic it doesn't you know you're just you, you jump you know, straight into the deep end. And similarly, right now, you know, we're disrupting this the the hegemonic framework that we know through these these this wonderful texture. But I think it might be helpful to to actually address the hegemonic framework, right? So for most people who understand this, they are understanding the way that they want to understand is, is is like exactly what you said that here are these foreign fighters that are coming from everywhere. Either they're altruistic or they're cra or they're pathological, right? But then we're reading that we're reading that retrospectively. We're reading that retrospectively in a way that already signals that they are foreign. I thought it was really great, actually. I heard your interview with Jeremy Scahill on his podcast. And one of the things that stuck out to me there was how you, 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 you highlighted this for the audience to say, it's really ironic that everybody was focused on removing you know, these fighters from Bosnia as if they were the largest concentration of foreign fighters when the American, you know, American troops numbering in the thousands, 
we're still in Iraq and Afghanistan, right? And so there's a, there's a foreignness that travels with this fighter that's, that we're reading onto. Um, and yet, so who, who are they? You know, what is this network? Some of them were in Afghanistan, in, according yeah, to your okay. research. Some of them were in Afghanistan also, you know, fighting the U.S. there. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they're part of these other formations that are formed in the aftermath of the Al-Qaeda attacks of, two, of 2001. They're, you know, we, there's a nebulous relationship that's made between them that's never justified beyond these, you know, top line assumptions. Yeah, no, thank you for for, for bringing this up. Um, this is just like a, it's such an, I mean, I kind of take it for granted because I've been working on this for a while, but it is such an important um, move to clarify because I think so much of our discussion around like political Islamism has been no different from our discussion of politics in general in that it's super, super state-centric. Right, so there's been so much attention on like, you know, uh, like movements that are trying to capture state power, um, or movements that are non-state but sort of uh, again with thinking with the with the, with the horizon of the state, right? So Hamas, Hezbollah, arguably um, would kind of fit into this, and I think part of the um, you know defensive crouch that uh, critical Middle Eastern studies you know has been in since 9/11 has been kind of saying look, uh, these so-called terrorist groups, they're not crazy, they're not pathological. You know, Hamas is involved in the framework of a national liberation struggle, same with Hezbollah and so on and so forth. Um, the, the limitation of that critical move has been to kind of, by implication, say, you know, well, these other groups that aren't fighting for a nation state, you know, they actually are kind of crazy. Right. Um, and I think that is a, a limitation that I want to address, you know, in this book to say, look, just because folks are involved in um, political violence and they're organizing on a transnational basis and that they're doing so as part of, um, you know, that they have pietistic orientations or commitments, um, that doesn't mean that they, that they are, you know, that you can't like think seriously about them as political actors, right? And it's, it's that combination of mobility, piety and violence that has made these folks uh, so, you know, it's just basically incited people to write lots of stupid things about them, right? And and that's even a lot of people who are critical. So um, so you know, that's really what the um, so part. So as as you mentioned, um, you know, we we know the story about um, Arabs who went to Afghanistan to fight the Soviet Union in the '80s, including people like Bin Laden. And then the typical narrative is that you know those people then go off and do 9/11 10 years later, and in the in the meantime this post cold war pre 911 moment what we miss out on is this very rich and complex landscape of different armed groups uh, that are engaged in jihad in different places with very different agendas right so in most of these places uh, the notion of jihad was muslims go and help other muslims fight against some you know people they're dealing with right so it could be the you know the soviets in afghanistan it could be the serbs and croats in bosnia um that's transnational and it does push against certain notions of sovereignty right like so the guys i write about were organizing you know in the name of a global muslim community or ummah but at the same time and, and they were you know largely like salafis but at the same time they were part of the bosnian army and taking orders from you know, uh, a, a sort of avowedly uh, nationalist, secular, multinational, um, you know, group of generals, right? Many of whom are not even Muslim. Um, and, you know, but then you have other people who are traveling and fighting because they're trying to basically overthrow their regimes back home, right? So that's especially true with the armed um, Egyptian groups who are fighting against the Mubarak regime. Um, and then you have uh, the group of people who eventually get called Al-Qaeda. And even there, you know, they're, they're, um, their project is to uh, go to war against the United States, and they see, you know, they see lots of targets of opportunity around the world, right? So they can hit an embassy in Kenya and Tanzania, or a destroyer in Yemen. Um, all of these are, um, I think, understandable and can be analyzed as political projects, and they can be debated and criticized and evaluated according to all sorts of criteria. But I think you know, that sort of conversation has often been dropped out when we have this just vaguer idea of, you know, well, they're not 
doing the nation state thing. Therefore, they don't believe in borders. They don't believe in, you know, rationality. They're just sort of off in, you know, in, in crazy land, right? And, and so, you know, what I really want to do is to encourage us to just have some basic idea of like rendering these people legible, right? And, and having a story about them that they can fit into that makes sense. Well, obviously, you know, the 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 story in Bosnia is one that disrupts that as you show us, right? That it's both beyond the nation state concept, but not a challenge to it. Because the Katiba that forms or the battalion that forms that is, you know, the home of many of your interlocutors is in an alliance with the Bosnian army and supports that independence project. So here we have, you know, the first, you know, I, I you in throughout the book, you're disrupting these these frameworks, these rigid frameworks that have been set up for us. Like you're for the state, you're against the state. And here you're showing us a lot of fluidity, right? As you're trying to tell us a story that they also have a vision of universalism, that they too can be, that their universalism is legitimate um, if we were so if we were to be able to to read them. So can you tell us about their universalism? Yeah, so for me, um, universalism is, I, I treat it as like, uh, like an actual category or a practice, right? Not as a normative thing. Um, so, you know, calling them, you know, saying that they're involved in universalism is not, um, it's not a condemnation and it's not a form of praise. Um, it's to say, look, they have a message that is being directed at all of humanity. And more importantly, they have to figure out how to actually make it happen. Um, in the face of all sorts of actual difference, right? Racial, cultural, doctrinal, and so on. And in this respect, um, Bosnia-Herzegovina in particular, you know, unfortunately became kind of a playground for all sorts of folks coming from outside during the war, um, peddling various universalist projects, right? So, you know, it was the site of the, the most prominent um, interventions of the international community in the 1990s, the largest ever UN peacekeeping force at the time. Um, you know, Bosnians, yeah, they just had, you know, as many people coming and offering them help in different ways as, you know, they could shake a stick at. Um, and in that sense, um, I kind of saw these fighters as engaged in something that was at a certain level, not that different from, you know, peacekeepers or humanitarian NGOs that I was kind of more familiar with from other, you know, places I had been, right? Um, so, you know, they were, again, trying to manage and process these forms of difference. And, uh, and the fact that they, you know, didn't have a huge amount of popular support um, by itself does not make them not universalist for me, right? Like, if we think about how human rights law works, a lot of, um, a lot of the exercise of international human rights law, as you well know, Nura, is you know basically a few elite lawyers deciding that they're the new right that belongs to all of humanity, <laughs> um, and then there's a complicated process by which that may or may not get legitimacy, kind of you know on a broader scale. Um, so in that sense, um, it's not fundamentally different than a lot of the folks I'm looking at. Right? They have a very very particular orientation towards Islam. It's not shared by most of the people in Bosnia, um, but it does give them a certain ability to take people from very different places, from very different backgrounds, and to, um, at a very practical level, put them together into um, a halfway functioning, you know, fighting force in the middle of an armed conflict, um, which I think is a, is a non-trivial task and, you know, interesting and worth kind of thinking with. So you bring up a number of things, right? You bring up the idea of difference and how we study difference. I really appreciate that. I'm going to get into that. But let's stay on universalism for a little bit longer. Because the other thing that your book offers, it's um, for those who haven't gotten the book, and you should, um, the book is written in, in what feels like several parts. The first part is in is in the ethnographic work. Then we then have an interlude, then followed by the juxtaposition of the universalism that's being proposed against other universalisms past and present. And so amongst those is the peacekeeping force that you mentioned, the largest force, what was that, 40,000 um, troops. And, and, and then another one is non-alignment, right? And so just staying on peacekeeping, it's really provocative, uh, Daryl, what you offer, which is, listen, peacekeepers and these mujahideen are both claiming the mantle of representing humanity, right? Are both claiming the mantle of being the international, that their that their mandate 
exceeds the borders and and modern you know nation states that they're and that they have the right to use force legitimate force even if they're not they're representing the any right particular right state now. what is it they're claiming the right to use force th th this is their claim right yeah. so mm -hmm. you basically set up this conundrum you know this 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 juxtaposition for the reader of well if you didn't think about it let me just put it in front of you peacekeepers and these mujahideen have a lot in common and mm -hmm. yet there is no way that that is a popular conception that we would see them as common. We would see them as diametrically opposed, which is also telling us a story of what is accepted as universal and on whose behalf. And it goes back to this idea that we can clearly identify the foreign fighters in Bosnia as foreign, but not identify the U.S. troops in Iraq as foreign and the largest foreign army. So tease that out for us a little bit. And, and I'm sure, you know, how you come to deal with these peacekeepers has a lot to do with your field work as well. Yeah, I mean, I think you just said it better than I can, right? I, it's um, the the whole, I mean, the entire foreign fighter discourse, you know, blows up, so to speak, around the US invasion of Iraq, right? And, you know, there's this, there's this notion that the US has that, okay, some Iraqis might be, um, displeased with the fact that we've occupied their country. So if there's some armed resistance to that, um, it's unfortunate, but we can find a way to, to kind of win over or conquer those people. But these other people, these non-Iraqis who are coming, um, they have no business being here. And they must be the crazy ones. They're the ones who are responsible for the suicide bombings. Um, those people um, are completely uh, beyond the pale and need to be kind of dealt with. They're the foreign fighters. Now, you know, you can say a lot of things about that discourse, but one of the things that's always been really striking is that um, you're, you are an invading army, several hundred thousand strong, talking about these other people as foreign fighters without any uh, self-consciousness or sense of irony. Um, and that is really the kind of, you know, conceptual hinge or motor really for the book, right? Like what, as you said, what counts as foreign, what counts as universal, right? And the Mujahideen are coming and saying, we're fellow Muslims, we're not foreign Arabs, um, which is how, you know, the U.S. wants to see you. The U.S. says, well, you know, we're not foreigners, we're internationals, right? We embody values that you Bosnians or people in any other part of the world um, aspire to, right? You want to be like us. So if there's any difference between us and you, that's just the difference between the universal and the particular. Um, and it's just a sign of your backwardness, basically. Um, whereas, and this is also what gets really perverse about, about the liberal logics of the war on terror. Um, the, the US argument in a place like Bosnia or in a place like Iraq about foreign fighters is an argument that says something like, you know, Muslims in these different countries, um, they're okay as long as they fit into their national boxes and as long as those national governments do what we want. Um, it's these other people who are coming, who are crossing national borders, they're the fanatics, they're the ones who have this um, you know, uh, um, unacceptable idea of Islam. And it's in order to protect the good local Muslims from the bad foreign Muslims that the US has to be doing what it's doing, right? So not only are we not waging a war against Islam, we're actually waging a war in defense of Muslim pluralism, right? Um, which is, again, like that's some pretty strong Kool-Aid, right? So, you know, the, all of these moves about declaring these other people as foreign, assuming that you yourself are international, um, all understanding that logic is why I think it's important to talk about universalism, right? As a, as a thing that people are actually, you know, doing or, or making claims to. Um, and that's, you know, that's, what the book is trying to unpack, even though it kind of has to do it in this roundabout way, right? Like I could have written a book that said, you know, here's a bunch of statements by the US military, you know, look at how crazy they are and, and deconstructed them. And that would have been, I think, fine. But I think it's it's different to say, you know, look, here's a group of people who you wouldn't even think of in the same, you know, um, in the same room as the concept of universalism and kind of um, sketch out how they are grappling with a structurally similar set of challenges. Um, and then to actually have a notion of what universalism looks like in practice, right? And then use that to come back and sort of like re-understand and, and, and sort of take apart what the US is doing.
I think that the Kool-Aid that you allude to is a Kool-Aid that was actually ingested a lot, according to the work that you show us, when we, we, we went in the aftermath of September 11th, right, in the advent of the global war on terror, suddenly these Arab um, fighters who had been given citizenship, who are part of the community, who have families and, and networks, are everyone's enemy. Everyone's enemy, even the enemy of Islam, right? So that that becomes, so I want to, and then there's a texture to that of who are they? And, and there, there's a lot of, there's a lot of um, texture between them. As you say, you're, you're yeah. bringing together such diversity. So how, what kind of relationships and hierarchies do they create? So let's set the stage for that. Let's set yeah, the stage so, for that. Um, <laughs> but yeah, there, there's so much to say here. So um, the, uh, so as I mentioned earlier, you know, these guys, um, they are largely kind of Salafis, for lack of a better term, um, which in the Bosnian context makes them outliers, right? So most Muslims in Bosnia, right, or Bosniaks, um, which is sort of the national descriptor, um, are, you know, many of them are not practicing, or if they are practicing, they kind of follow like the, the Hanafi method. Um, there is, of course, a, you know, there's a rich sort of scene of um, Islamic actors in Bosnia. Um, and there, you know, there's a lot of tension, right? And the book kind of charts a lot of the pushback that these fighters encountered from uh, Bosnian imams and ulama. Um, at the same time, I think it's important not to uh, overemphasize those tensions, right? Or rather, those tensions get turned into something that becomes like a hard national or racial boundary, right? Of like the bad Arab versus the good moderate Bosnian Muslim. Um, so I, I really try to show in the book, you know, the diversity of um, Muslim religious experience in Bosnia at the, during the time of the war, right? Because there were um, a relatively, you know, small number of um, Bosnian Muslims who decided that they needed to um, not only participate in the war, but to do so on pious terms. Um, and those folks ended up uh, being kind of like natural interlocutors and partners for the Arabs who showed up. Um, but then the problem is a lot of them were also uh, Naqshbandi Sufis. Um, and so you have a lot of these doctrinal tensions between Sufis and Salafis that kind of come up. But even there, the stereotypical expectation doesn't really play out. Because if you think about it, in a context like Bosnia-Herzegovina, um, Sufis and Salafis might disagree on a lot of things doctrinally, but they might have more in common with each other as actually, you know, people who are committed to religious practice, you know, in, in the landscape where many, many other people are not. Um, so there's a moment of tension, but then there's also a moment of accommodation. And the creation of this battalion that you mentioned earlier, the Katiba, was in part um, meant to kind of segregate the uh, Arab Salafi fighters from the Bosnian Sufis who they had previously been like working very closely with. Um, so again, you know, this is part of this is just about capturing some of the, the, the diversity and the richness of kind of the religious practice landscapes um, and to get away from kind of the national um, stereotyping. Um, and, um, and then so the, you know, the, so there are even within Bosnia, you know, there's a very strong idea that these people represent, uh, you know, sort of backward religious practices and you know, the Bosniaks have had to endure, you know, relentless uh, demonization by Serb and Croat nationalists, right? Depicting them as, you know, fundamentalist terrorists and so on and so forth. And here the racialization of Islam is important to attend to, right? What makes the Bosnian uh, conflict really special is that it takes place in Europe and the mass atrocities um, that are like kind of uh, sort of put all over the news um, elicit this incredible attention and concern in the liberal West, but it's a confused concern because, you know, Western elites see emaciated bodies um, in, you know, behind barbed wire and they think Holocaust, but then they also know that these people are Muslim, so they're kind of like not sure what to make of that. Um, similarly, Muslim communities around the world um, also are, you know, affected by sort of global notions of white supremacy that also racialize Islam as not white. So for them too, there's also this like fascination of like, oh, there's like these European Muslims, white Muslims, it's, you know, and, and of course, you know, worshiping whiteness is something that, you know, affects 
communities all over the place. Um, so this, um, so the, the, the perceived whiteness of Bosnian Muslims is a source of fascination, but also a source of skepticism, right? From all the different people who think they want to help and, and think they want to offer help. So if you're a Bosnian Muslim and you're trying to push back against all these Serb and Croat nationalists calling you, you know, a closet fundamentalist, white Al Qaeda, you know, someone who seems like a good European but is actually secretly a, you know, a backwards fanatic, you look at these people, the Arabs, right, with their beards and with their, you know, women with maqabs, and you think, oh my God, these people embody the stereotype that is being foisted on us. And it's unsurprising that for some of them, not all, but for some, the reaction is get these people away from me, right? So, um, and because there was just genuine tension, right? There were just people coming and saying, hey, you know, there were all these stories of like Arab fighters going around, you know, telling people not to drink or harassing, you know, uh, uh, mixed gender couples walking with their, you know, like all those sorts of stories exist, but, all, but I want to make sure that they're kind of placed in this context of, um, all of these kind of cross-cutting concerns around race, civilizational discourse, Islamophobia, and so on, that are suffusing the war in Bosnia, but also kind of connecting it with, with audiences and contexts all over the place. Okay. So let's go a little bit deeper. So I'm going to, your, your, the race and racialization is a, is a significant theme in your text. And so you've already mentioned one form of it, which is this idea of you know, Bosnia on the periphery of Europe at the same time, you know, um, so there's this civilizational ra racial, you know, racialization that's happening, but simultaneously they're white, right? And, and within, you know, and, and, and their Muslimness makes them othered um, within the context of, of the former Yugoslavia as well, right? But then there's another piece, which is what you also alluded to, which is the real um, foreigner, right? The, the woman in niqab, the Salafi, so here I want to ask you a question a bit larger than than just the book itself, but it's I, this idea about the racialization of Islam. Islam is a religion. It exceeds nationality. It exceeds a particular race. And yet we have, we, you know, increasingly refer to anti-Muslim racism. I think when we say Islamophobia, it's almost a stand-in that this is a form of racism. But don't question that this is a religion and not an immutable category. Right. And yet there's there's a process here that undergirds that that you address very much. So what I what I'd love for you to do is to address this idea. Can you be racist against Muslims put in the broadest terms and then in the detail of your own work? Right. And this is this is why this question asked on its own is so frustrating because it misses this texture. But I want to put it out there. But the texture has to do with. How did um, Muslim nationality become legislated, right, in the 1960s, right? Who was included in that Muslim nationality? How was it distinct even amongst the Muslims, right, who you refer to as, you know, other non-Slav categories, primarily a a Albanian versus those who identify as, as Muslimani? So now we get into the texture of it and we can begin, like, this, this is entwined with a juridical process, yeah, so um, you weren't kidding when you said you're going to go deep. So uh, I mean, we have to unpack like Muslimness as a practice category, Muslimness as a nationality, and Muslimness as a logic of racialization. Um, I'm I'm still a little ambivalent about this, but I think I would come down on the side of saying yes, you can be quote unquote racist against Muslims in the specific sense that um, I think there is a logic of treating. Muslim as a racial category. Mm. Um, and the people who experience that in the United States are often like Sikhs, for example, right? So I think there, there's in, in kind of in the US context and in similar contexts, there is a racial idea of what Muslimness is, which of course doesn't correspond very well with like people who consider themselves to be Muslims as a matter of faith. Um, but I think what we have to attend to on top of that is to keep in mind that you know, racial hierarchy or processes of racialization is not this like, you know, uh, ready-made, cohesive, you know, uh, all things, pieces fitting together framework, right? Processes of racialization are extremely messy, historically varied, uh, and, and, and contextually also very, very different. Um, so we have to attend to 
not only this racialization of Muslims, whatever that might mean, but also the other forms of racialization that um, that cross cut the category of Muslims anyway, right? Like especially blackness. Um, so you know, there I think in the um, the politics of kind of liberal responses to anti-Muslim sentiment, however we want to classify it in the US, has led us to often talk about um, sort of anti-Muslim racism as a as like a progressive response, which I completely understand the impulse behind, but it's very important that we attend to how that coexists with and influences and is influenced by like anti-black racism, um, other, other sort of regimes of racialization. And I actually have a, a piece I'm working on um, that tries to get at some of this stuff by thinking about the category of blackness in Guantanamo, right? By looking at the experiences of captives in Guantanamo who are both Muslim and black, right? And, and also thinking about how their blackness is uh, constructed differently you know, in the Middle East and South Asia versus when they show up kind of in the, in the hands of the US, right, with its own racial logics. So I think, you know, that's part of the reason why all of these discussions end up being um, a bit slippery, right? So I, I totally. for those who are doing this sort of critical work on like racialization, Muslims and war on terror, I would offer this note of caution that we want to be very attentive to um, other forms of racialization and racism that are also out there, very powerful. And thinking about like, you know, when are we talking about analogy? When are we talking about appropriation, right? When are we talking about, you know, intersection and overlap? Like these are, these are not straightforward questions, right? And I think there, you know, there's a lot of important, you know, thinking and mapping that needs to be done. Now, in the, in the, for your question about nationality, this is an issue that arises um, in, in South Asia and in the Balkans in particular, right? Where you have Muslimness as a nationality category, especially in places where um, phenotype, language, other things are, are not as helpful as like distinguishing characteristics, right? So in the context of, um, of ex-Yugoslavia, you know, there's this, uh, there's this notion or trope that the Muslims were kind of like uh, behind the curve in developing national consciousness, right? So the Serbs define themselves as a nation, the Croats define themselves as a nation, Bosnians, mm, it's not clear. There's times where uh, Serbs and Croats try to claim them and say, oh, no, no, these are just Croats of the Muslim faith, right? Which is why during World War II, for example, uh, the fascist regime in Croatia had a significant um, Muslim component to it, right? Even though many other Muslims were opposed to it. Um, and as you mentioned, you know, with, with the Yugoslav state, they gradually uh, legislate and approve this idea that, um, that, Slavs, that Slavs of Muslim background in Bosnia are themselves a national category. Um, and they call them Muslims with a capital M, right, Muslimani. Um, through the 90s and in recent decades, it's become more kind of, you know, uh, recognized for these people to call themselves Bosniaks. Right, and, and that's the term that's more kind of generally used right now. The reason why all this is important is because out of all the different republics that made up Yugoslavia, um, Bosnia-Herzegovina was the only one that didn't clearly belong to one national group, right? So you had Serbia for the Serbs, Croatia for the Croats. Bosnia was treated as, uh, you know, the state of Muslims, Serbs, and Croats alike. And and none of these groups had a clear demographic majority, even though the Muslims slash Bosniaks were the largest group. Um, for that reason, when Yugoslavia is torn apart and people start mobilizing along national lines, first and foremost, um, it's unsurprising that Bosnia is where, uh, is where the conflict is worse because you have these three different groups that, um, that you know, uh, that are, if not equally powerful, all have, you know, clear sort of bases of support and ability to inflict a lot of damage. Of course, the Bosnian Muslims bear the vast, vast brunt of the mass atrocities. Um, and, um, but anyway, so the, the, the dynamics of sort of Muslim nationality are also interesting when you're talking about, if you're someone coming from the Middle East, you might be thinking of Muslim more as a practice category than a national category, right? So it's also a little bit, you know, the the jihad fighters who come on the one hand they want to downplay national distinctions between muslims right they want to say we're all one ummah let's not be too concerned about who's a syrian who's a pakistani whatever um, on the other hand the people that they're trying to help 
are identifying themselves primarily as Muslims by nationality, right? With or without practicing, right? You can be a Muslim nationalist in Bosnia and not necessarily practice, right? Of course, many of them did, but many of them didn't. So that ends up being confusing for the Salafis who show up, right? So there's this, every universalist project wants to help a local group of people, but then also has suspicions about whether that local group of people is really like deserving of that help. Wow. Right. So for the West coming in, it's like, okay, are these people good Muslims or bad Muslims? Right. And for the Salafis coming, it's are they good Muslims or bad Muslims? But of course, their definition of what a good Muslim is is a very different one. You got my you got me off off topic because now I'm just thinking about, you know, this idea of, of solidarity and, you know, a lot of the conflict that's come up in, in solidarity work that we've done, Daryl, where some of the questions become, you know, in sincerely or manipula manipulatively, do these people deserve our solidarity? Right. Um, so that, that's an interesting theme. To run. But on solidarity. On solidarity and actually on sovereignty, you 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 also do something that's really interesting here, where you unsettle for us um, sovereignty, right? Miracle, exception, and solidarity, right? And so I, let, let me walk the audience through this a little bit, which is to highlight your um, cover. This beautiful cover by Amar Khuri, right, is, you know, from what I can tell, this is an image from from the the war, right? In 1995. Mm -hmm. But it also harkens back to a miracle in Islamic history of the Battle of Badr, right? So and so you mm -hmm. use this story of miracle as exceeding, right? As exceeding the the rational space, right? And and basically you draw on Carl Schmidt in order to say something about, you know, the sovereign. Is he who decides, and it's a secularized form of, the, you know, some sort of divine authority, right? But you kind of, there's a there's a moment I see you do this, a bit of a slippage in saying miracle can be, can be understood as exception, but exceeds it because it provides a framework for solidarity. Could be, yep. Mm -hmm. So what, what are you trying to tell us here where the, 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 you start us off with sovereignty, but yeah. you use miracle as an index for exception, to understand it not as a sovereignty, but as a form of solidarity. Exactly. Yep. So that's it. I'm uh, done. <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> okay, but like, so the the standard account is, you know, uh, you have. I mean, again, this is like super wrong on many levels. But the standard account is like you have religion, and then you have the secular state. Right. And the secular state kind of like, you know, uh, is like mini God in a particular territory. Right. So the sovereign can declare the exception. The sovereign can do whatever, a monopoly on violence, blah, blah, blah. And when the sovereign invokes its extra power, that's like the, you know, mini version of the divine miracle. Right. So that's kind of like a standard way of of like that's that's like your that's like you know uh, McDonald's Happy Meal version of political theology. So what I want to do with you know with the book here is to say, well, what if you have a group of people who are not out to get sovereignty, right? Like these mujahideen, you know, they talk about the ummah, right? But there isn't like a concrete project of saying, oh, let's just make one government for all the Muslims in the world. Right. It's much more of a solidaristic project. It's much more, hey, there are Muslims who are suffering mass atrocity. Let's go and help them. Right. So it's a political claim, but it's not a claim that's oriented towards the state. And what we find is they also have access to the language of miracles. Right. So they talk about, you know, uh, these karamat. And of course, yeah, they're, they're all sort of based on the, um, you know, uh, models or templates. Of, of karamat or miracles from early Islamic history. Um, so there it's basically just to say that, you know, uh, although we act like sovereign states are able to kind of like miniaturize and take over like the power of the divine, they can't. There's always this kind of residual leftover thing that they can't really capture, right? And these transnational groups are trying to tap into that in some way. And the reason why we know they can't capture it is look at international law. Look at all the debates around humanitarian intervention, 
on the one hand, formally speaking, we keep saying, oh, you know, only states can go to war, right? The authority for violence in the international system is only based in nation states. But then there's always this argument when we're talking about humanitarian intervention, R2P, whatever, there's always a, a claim to something else, right? Something bigger than the nation state. Humanity, civilization, the international community, right? Some kind Big of thing. Yeah. residual yeah. authority. Yeah. So it doesn't have to be those things. It can also, you know, draw from other vocabularies, other traditions, and other ways of thinking. In this particular case, Islamic ones. But what of the relationship between sovereignty and solidarity? So you tell us of that which cannot be captured. But I want to, you know, um, this thing about uh, what does it tell us about the Universalist Project? That if there is this thing that can't be captured and therefore it can only be explained through solidarity, is that a, a particular form of universalism that's being offered? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, so I think a Universalist Project can have different political logics to it, right? So uh, when, when the UN and NATO, for example, is intervening in Bosnia, they're engaged in a universalist project, but they're not embracing the political logic of solidarity, right? They're embracing the logic of intervention. You know, all you local factions, you know, you're all, you know, terrible and we're going to step in and kind of like knock heads or, or separate you because you're warning children. So they're universalist because they're talking about humanity and they're doing all this, like, you know, all of this stuff that interventions are criticized for, but they're not engaged in solidarity, right? Um, the jihad groups I'm talking about are engaged in, they're engaged in a universalist project, but not in the mode of intervention, right? They're actively taking a side. Right, they're partisans. Right, so they're fighting alongside the Muslims against the Serbs and Croats. They still, because they are universalist, they still have a place for Serbs and Croats in their vision. Right, even though it's like very hypothetical and problematic. Right, but there is that dimension to it. Now, it might be the case, and I haven't thought about this enough, that you can talk about movements that are solidaristic but not universalistic. Right, so I'm Group A. I'm going to help you, Group B for some reason, but not necessarily attached to a vision for like what humanity should be about. Um, that doesn't really come up in, in the book itself, but I think it's like a like a logical possibility that it makes sense to think about. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, there's a lot of questions that you, I mean, there's such richness, but also such broadness. I wanna stay on sovereignty for a little bit longer. Um, and this is another offering that you make, which, and this is, you know, especially in thinking about um, you know, uh, a, a universalism, universalism today in the United States, uh, you do this thing when you want to disrupt even for the reader who has understood Guantanamo as a central um, location of carcerality to think about that as, as much more diffuse in the same way that sovereignty in the sense is not merely about the U.S., but what you describe as the sovereign underground. Um, and you compare that, you know, you make the analogy, if I'm correct, to neocolonialism, right, where there isn't, there isn't necessarily an overt dominance, you know, which, which obscures um, who's doing the, the colonialism. But at the same time, there's people who are being harmed who have no way of redressing it either, right? And, and the, so your sovereign underground does very similar work. And you want us to think about sovereignty that's not located or captured, but that, re, you know, can have its effect in this way that's very harmful, but that is much more difficult to locate and, and to hold accountable. Um, so can you introduce us to your sovereign underground and how it plays out in your context? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, so Madiha Bahar has, I think, an even better phrase, which is distributed sovereignty, mm -hmm. right? So I think, you know, uh, with the, in the late 1990s, early 2000s, as thinkers like Carl Schmitt and Giorgio Agamben get kind of trendy, um, this category of sovereignty just starts appearing everywhere, right? And it's, it's sort of like, it stands in for everything, it explains everything, um, it kind of ends up just meaning like power or authority, and it just gets super confusing as far as I'm concerned. Um, what I want to do in that chapter is to say, look, um, you can't understand US empire without understanding the fact that um, it operates through other countries that are, at least formally speaking, independent and equal, right? So you can't just say, oh, the US is acting like a sovereign on a world scale. 
Like you have to take into account how other countries are kind of signing on and how that, um, that makes a lot of the dirty work of US empire invisible, right? So as you mentioned, Guantanamo is really just like, uh, a, I wouldn't say it's a distraction, but it's like, you know, if you have a subway system, right? There's a few stops that are gonna be above ground, um, but most of them are gonna be underground. And that's sort of how I think about Guantanamo being above ground, very visible, everyone's talking about it. But all of these other sites of detention, some of which are run by the CIA, some of which are run by other countries where the CIA just emails questions to the interrogators, right? Um, that whole network of carceral practices is what you need to get at if you want to understand the war on terror. Um, and yeah, if you think about sovereignty as just you know something that, um, if your model of sovereignty is a country or a government that's kind of abusing its own citizens um, and not a country that is exercising power around the world through the consent, alleged consent of other governments, then you're gonna miss out on all of these really important aspects of how US imperial power actually works. And in this sense, yeah, I think I think Nkrumah's analysis and neocolonialism, the book Neocolonialism is super, um, super relevant and super on point still. This isn't something that you, I think, um, tell the reader ever directly, but I was left, you know, even as someone who studies this, who has, has traveled, you know, um, to the region as, as part of my own work. Um, why does Bosnia, the Bosnian leadership, adopt the U.S.'s imperatives wholesale in the deport, you know, the denationalization and deportation and hunting process? Were there, were there, um, you know, was there, I, I know that there were, cables that you ended up finding that, dem you know, made very clear that this was a U.S. imperative, right? But then, but why? Was there funding? Was there something that was, what was at stake? I mean, I think what's at stake is kind of the, um, you know, the survival and viability of Bosnia-Herzegovina as, as a state, on paper at least. So um, Bosnia is, you know, this is the problem with, you um, there, you know, we're used to places where, uh, where, um, so there's cases where there's a war or there's like some sort of human rights mass atrocity situation that are clearly in the backyard of a major world power, right? In those cases, it's pretty easy to know who the responsibility lies with and who you need to be for and against, right? So if you want to talk about like the U.S. and Central America, if you want to talk about like you know, um, Palestine, or if you want to talk about like Tibet, for example, right? Um, other places like the Balkans, Syria are places where great power competition is an important aspect of what's going on. And I think that's been an area that's been extremely difficult and thorny and divisive for the left, such as it is based in the West to think with, right? Because they get, you know, it, it is confusing in terms of like, you know, the sort of cross-cutting imperatives. Um, so for Bosnian, for the Bosnian Muslim slash Bosniak leadership during the war, they felt that they had to, um, that their only hope was to get the U.S. on their side. And so they relentlessly lobbied um, to, to do so. Um, and I mean, they also sought help wherever they could. They got help from the Saudis and from Iran, but they were really invested in U.S. assistance, right? And it was the U.S. that finally, the U.S., again, echoes of Syria was content to let different sides kind of bleed each other out. So the US on the one hand um, bombed uh, Serb forces at the end of the war um, when mass atrocities became intolerable. On the other hand, they supported a UN weapons embargo that kept the Bosnian Muslims from being able to defend themselves, right? So the US kind of had this um, idea that they would, uh, you know, sort of stroll into the party late and get to be the ones who uh, get credit for for ending the war and imposing a peace treaty and so on. Um, so what they what Richard Holbrook, the U.S. envoy, did was essentially uh, broker an agreement where Bosnia Herzegovina would exist as a unified state on paper, but that it's it would be totally divided along nationalist lines, right? So um, if you think about like Lebanon, for example, where like important government positions are kind of parceled out on sectarian basis. Bosnia ramps that up to a whole other level by um, distributing all sorts of institutional positions, as well as having formal 
territorial soft partition, right? So you have half the country that's called Republika Srpska, the you know Serb Republic, and that has total that has huge amounts of autonomy. That's 49% of the territory. You've got this other part of the country. There's like three, uh, there's like three presidents, you know, multiple prime ministers. It's an extremely convoluted um, and, and labyrinthine constitutional structure. Like just the ballot at election time is like many, many pages, right? Um, and this is a system that essentially locks in and incentivizes and perpetuates um, paralysis and dysfunctionality um, along nationalist lines. Um, and uh, so there's a there's this dynamic where um, nationalist actors are empowered and rewarded, and then that makes it seem like international intervention is required. Um, and then once that happens, because everyone knows international international intervention is coming, also creates like perverse incentives for the actors on the ground. So it's this really twisted cycle. So for a lot of the Bosniak political elite, um, there was a decision that you know the U.S. was really um, an important protector, right? And that Russia is backing the Serbs or backing Serbia next door, um, and therefore the U.S. is the is the is the only alternative. Um, so you also have really interesting alignments um, between uh, sort of some Bosniak politicians and also uh, the Zionist lobby in the U.S., right? Because there was this notion in the '90s that in order to get the U.S. on your side, you needed to have uh, you needed to have sort of pro-Israel forces on your side as well. Um, so a lot of the narratives around like uh, sort of coexistence, Jewish Muslim coexistence in Bosnia, whatever, whatever, also have that kind of um, political sort of context to them. Um, and also, you know, for, for uh, foreign policy elites in the US in the 1990s, many of whom were ardent supporters of Israel, they were also supporters of Bosnia as a way to also um, basically show that they are not racist against Muslims, right? So the politics of this are, are yeah, they're just, they cut across a lot of the conventional um, expectations and that's part of what makes this um, an important and interesting um, uh, sort of case to look at. I wanna, I, I'm, we're taxing your time. I wanna do, um, and I obviously, I have pages of notes, Daryl. I had <laughs> such a great time reading this. Um, and I do encourage our, listeners and our watchers and our audience to definitely get their book, get their hands on the book. Um, but I want to do a couple more things as, as um, we're rounding out, which is to pose to you questions from the audience, as well as, you know, um, to highlight some of the funniest things that I think you did. <laughs> but before that, there, there is another question that has nothing to do, you know, you kind of touched on it now as you were talking that isn't necessarily in the book, but it's one of the things I always think about when folks want to impose partition as solution, right? Because it seems like the cleanest, the most sensible, the most logical, the most within reach. And obviously, as someone who works on Palestine, everybody just, just divide it up, just divide up, you know, thinking that partition is that easy. Yet as you read your book, you realize that this is the lesson of why partition should never be the answer and can't be the answer. It's not easy nor is it viable. So are there lessons that you learn, you know, more universal lessons that you can share with us about this idea? I don't know. For some people in their head, it just, it's so much simpler to think about division, partition, nationality as clean categories. It's almost why, why the right, right, the right wing is always so much more effective because their ideas are just simpler. Mm -hmm. And yet what you're showing us is that it's not that simple. And it's 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 not the optimal. Yeah. On, so can you can you comment on that about you know the, the logics of partition and nationality as viable solutions? Yeah, I mean the you know um, as many many people have said right like if you have a lived reality where people are all mixed together, then tearing them apart is never going to be clean, it's never going to be easy, and it's not going to resolve the underlying tensions. It's just going to ratchet those tensions up to a different level, right? So instead of neighbor versus neighbor, it might be state versus state. Um, and, you know, so I think that's a pretty common trope in the critiques of partition, whether we're talking about uh, India, Pakistan, Palestine, um, Balkans, and so on. Um, I think the, the counter argument uh, in Bosnia, for example, would simply be um, it's terrible, but it's less bad than the alternative, mm -hmm. right? Um, and 
you know, it, it's tough to get into that kind of argument because there's like a lot of counterfactual stuff that's going on, right? So I can point to all of the things that are dysfunctional about post-war Bosnia, and someone can just say, well, it's still better than, you know, having the war continue as it did. Um, so it, it, I think that, um, uh, that you know, there's, there's like the danger of like getting into a cul-de-sac with some of those arguments, right? So I think it's also important to just argue on principle. Right, so not just the argument of like, it doesn't work, although I think there's lots of evidence for that, but also just what kind of world we wanna live in, right? You know, like do, do, if we think tolerance is important, if we think like you know, non, if we think that uh, a commitment to like ethno-racial homogeneity is something that's, you know, uh, objectionable and needs to be fought, then I think there's, you know, we have to make that argument. Um, and, you know, that raises questions of like, what does a common political project look like? then. Um, and I think some of, you know, so sometimes critics of partition also don't necessarily know how to, you know, articulate something that actually is kind of palatable um, and, and appealing to like to all the people they claim to be trying to reach. I think that's something that's, you know, a challenge sort of on the other side. But, you know, it is something, I mean, this is also important because um, the, the war in Bosnia is, so it's interesting to be working on a project for so long that it goes from being current events to like forgotten history <laughs> um, and uh, forgotten at least for the, you know, some of the audience that I'm speaking to, not for the people who experienced it, of course. Um, but the, uh, one of the things that's really um, disturbing is that although the Bosnian conflict and the wars in ex Yugoslavia kind of faded from prominence in Western media over say the past 10, 15 years, they've reemerged um, in uh, white nationalist circles in Europe and the US. So there is a lot of fascination with Bosnia um, in those circles. And part of it is because they know that these racial categories of Muslimness and whiteness don't quite work in Bosnia. So they they're actively are trying to um, pay attention to and understand their, and to develop a narrative around what happened in Bosnia. So there's a lot of white nationalist interest in, in Bosnia right now. And of course, there's been some investigation on like links between like uh, some Serb nationalist groups and like right-wing nationalist groups in, in Europe. And I think the US as well, if I'm not mistaken. So that's another um, sort of, you know, active uh, front of, uh, of political sort of development and realignment um, that's, that's, you know, interesting and noteworthy. At, I want to ask you a question that actually came up in the chat that probably you're going to get everywhere, regardless of how you could speak for two more hours and you're still going to get this question, which probably makes me wonder if I shouldn't have asked you it first, which is basically that religious logic can never be universal because, because it is essentially particular, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know... I'm just going to give that to you. I should have asked you that yeah. first. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that, that is definitely the, the first question that I often get. <laughs> and, you know, I think uh, that um, that question only makes sense after we've baked in certain assumptions around secularism really, really deeply. So the way that I try to explain this is like with a thought experiment, right? If you imagine... Um, uh, a human society that's been isolated from the rest of the world um, and you go to them and you say, um, look, um, why don't you join us? And joining us entails subscribing to um, monotheism um, as understood through a certain sacred text and we would also like you to abstain from certain activities and to um, pray five times a day and to fast for a month of the year. And here's a list of things that we want you to do. Um, and then you were to go to them and say, you can believe anything you want cosmologically um, in terms of like, you know, the nature of the universe and, div and divinity and whatever, but we want you to reorganize your society such that uh, the way you get stuff is through money. And the way you get money is by uh, uh, working for other people um, and you have like a calendar of a certain kind and, a, and you have something called work week and you sort I mean, you know, at a certain level, it's not obvious at all that religion is more um, 
you know, or put it this way, the idea that religion is more particular than, say, secularism um, itself assumes certain ideas of secularism, including this like radical separation between inside faith and like the practical or real world around you. Um, and the other way of thinking about it is, look, you know, there's, uh, you know, however billion people in the world who identify as Muslim and who at some level, right, and, and varying degrees of, 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 of care, you know, might identify with Muslims around the world. Um, I don't think you can find more than a few hundred million people in the world who think of the international community as a category that makes any sense to them or feel any belonging to it or feel any sort of identification with it. Um, so all of this is to say, I'm not at all interested in like what's really universal and what's not, right? What's, what I'm trying to say is people make universalist claims all the time. And when they do so, interesting things can happen. And what does that look like? Um, a universalist project might have, you know, 50 believers, right? That doesn't make it not universalist. It might make it less interesting if they don't have as much, you know, purchase or not as much influence in the world. Um, but it's it's the, the nature of the aspiration itself is what um, is what matters to me. I wonder if that's not because am I can you hear me? Mm, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I've become so sensitive. I wonder if that's not because of the way that we tend to think about, you know, the systems that regulate our lives as somehow not as intrusive as things that are on our personal body, right? So it's the thing, yes. the same way that I'm now more concerned with how I can dress than the fact that my survival is contingent on selling my labor, right? Yes. Or or like ascribing to a racial hierarchy that puts me somewhere as white adjacent, but not, you know, and non-black, right? Mm -hmm. That these are things that regulate my life very, very closely and well, and that we take them for granted. But once it becomes what I can wear, now that's particular and it's so yeah. close. Yeah, it's that. So that, that's really helpful how you frame that. And it's also helpful to think about, you know, how, how the conversation about, the, about systems versus individual experience is a difficult one to have. Um, so... Uh, let me let me just ask you another question around or let me just point this out for the audience. One of the other things that you do for us in thinking is, Daryl, in addition to being an attorney and an, ethno and an anthropologist, you know, um, and an activist, I would say, is that you're you're an investigative journalist. The holes that you go down in doing this research are fascinating from unearthing somebody's true identity right, to connecting certain characters that you're reading in the docket to people that you're meeting who you've heard about in conversation. Or what I found really interesting and a really significant part of the text was when you're describing um, jihadist work, right, um, um, scholarly work, so to speak. And so there was one book that becomes really, really, what's the book that becomes really popular? It's called The Sealed Nectar, right? right yeah. mm -hmm. And you highlight for us how the second half of the book is actually from another text that was brought. So I know that th this is going back into the particular of the book, but what about these texts? Why are they relevant in also helping to create and suture a, for, uh, a universalism amongst uh, such disparate people? Yeah, so uh, I think the standard um, approach, you know, in like jihadology, if you will, is to uh, really kind of, fetishize a certain notion of Islamic texts, right? So the argument is kind of like, you know, let's find some thinker like, I don't know, uh, Sayyid Qutb or Abdul uh, Azam, and you kind of get their texts and then you've, you've kind of cracked the code to the jihadi mindset, right? Um, so, you know, when I started this research, I was like, okay, what are the, what are the books that these people are publishing and reading? And what I realized was that uh, they're not really engaging with the standard canon of like, you know, greatest jihadi textual hits, right, as one might expect. Um, and, you know, the, the books, I mean, the most popular book is, uh, is as I mentioned, The Sealed Nectar, uh, which is a seer, right? It's a, it's a biography of the, of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So, uh, you know, and it has very little to do, it's like not really a jihadist text as such. Of course, it talks about his life and therefore jihad comes up in it. Um, so again, I, it's just a simple thing of like, instead, let, like, let's just, you know, extract 
you know, head from ass in terms of like the self-referential jihad studies discourse and actually look at what the people involved in these things are reading and thinking with. And um, so most of these texts, as I mentioned, are not really about jihad. They are about kind of inculcating what we can broadly understand as a Salafi orientation to Islam. Um, and the texts are popular beyond the jihad context, right? Um, because these jihad fighters, they see themselves as fighting, but they also see themselves as like bringing correct Islam to the Bosnians. Um, and so they're translating these texts and kind of distributing them and then some humanitarian groups, you know, redistribute them. Um, and one of the upshots of this is, you know, I think the standard uh, terrorism studies approach might be to say, uh, or to ask the question of, hey, um, is adherence to these religious practices somehow a cover for or a gateway drug to engagement in political violence, right? So mm. where are the terrorists? You look for the Salafis. Where are the Salafis? You see the beards, you see the niqabs, you know, boom, there you go. Um, what it actually makes much more sense to say these people um, were engaged in jihad as a gateway drug to Salafism, right? In the sense that, you know, they were saying, the because a lot of Salafis, I, I should back up, a lot of Salafis were very, very skeptical of transnational jihad mobilization. Um, the, the jihad in Afghanistan was not universally seen as a success um, around kind of Muslim communities around the world. Yes, the Soviets left, great, but then almost immediately afterwards, the Afghan Mujahideen factions started turning against each other. So there were a lot of Salafi scholars, very prominent ones, who were like, this, was, this wasn't really a jihad. These people were just pursuing their narrow political interests. And then if someone came to them and said, well, you know, what about jihad in Bosnia? They might say something like, well, the Bosnian Muslims aren't, you know, they're not really Muslims, quote unquote, right? They don't really practice correctly. Their spiritual uh, uh, development has been has been stymied by living under communism or living under the Ottomans, whatever. Um, so one of the arguments that, that the folks I'm writing about made was, look, yes, we might think that the Bosnian Muslims don't practice Islam as we think they should. The best way to reach them is to go and participate in their armed struggle alongside them. Um, so they had to emphasize both the, the proselytizing or da'wah um, alongside uh, sort of the jihad activity, um, which is also why you have a lot of people who, you know, go to fight and then get disillusioned and do aid work instead, or go thinking that they're going to do aid work and then end up in, in jihad. Because what's important is that this is a context of transnational solidarity activism um, in an Islamic idiom. So the specifics of whether you help. I mean, most people who went to Bosnia just wanted to go and help in some way, right? Whether they helped by picking up a gun or by, um, you know, uh, handing out blankets was kind of a secondary question, which is also why a lot of people ended up doing both of those things. Um, so in the security mindset, this is, oh, you know, aid is being used as a cover for terrorism, right? But for a lot of these folks, there just wasn't like this massive contradiction. Right, so they could openly be doing aid work and jihad work because they were just trying to help through any means that they could. Yeah, I mean, and 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 just for the audience that's tuning in, um, Daryl doesn't just tell us this, but his characters are telling us this. Like Abu Hamza, who is a humanitarian at some point and a fighter, and somebody who is a detainee, and somebody who has an immigration issue, and somebody who is being, you know, subject to human rights violations. So that you see this this identity that's constantly universal take many, many different shapes. Um, there's obviously more themes here about, right, universalism alongside internationalism and the distinctions. Um, there's themes on gender that we didn't get, which I, I, I see you grappling with uh, throughout the text. There's the intimacies that become so interesting, um, right? Brothers in jihad, brothers in law, um, and the relationship between Gulf Arabs and and, and other Arabs. And so I'm saying all this as teasers for the audience because I'm going to round out and I want to end with your greatest hits, right? This like uh, snarky greatest hits. Um, so we heard about one of them here, which was the jihadi greatest hits. 
But that attitude and that tone, y'all, that that Daryl is taking with us is something that we don't lose in the text, which is what makes it such a great read. Um, my personal favorite was in a footnote when uh, Daryl refers to the Nazi regime as runner up colonizers. Um, but my runner up to my favorite was well, let me hold on. I had to write this. OK, which is how you describe terrorism experts. OK, quote. And this isn't in the footnote. This is in the text. Quote, they are less faithful scribes of empire than they are enterprising vendors eagerly hawking new wares in the hopes of catching the eye of a fickly and easily distracted person. End quote. Um, so shout out for those. Do you have any favorites, Daryl, in your text? <laughs> um, I, I, I don't. I mean, I just try to keep <laughs> myself entertained while writing the book and to keep the readers entertained as well. Good um, work. I, yeah, I, um, with that particular line that you're reading, um, I think part of what I want to do, part of one of the challenges of this book was how do you write about something that's been written about to death, but in a way that is like so fundamentally wrongheaded, right? And if you start off by trying to debunk all of that stuff, the danger is you end up kind of like, con you know, limiting yourself to their parameters and lowering yourself to their level. Right. But if you ignore them, then that's also problematic because there's just, you know, you're not confronting this massive, like, you know, uh, word salad fog problem. And um, so I tried to treat uh, the terrorism expertise world kind of as a speed bump, right? Kind of as like a necessary evil that had to be addressed and quickly kind of like demonstrated on terms that are kind of according to their own criteria, like, how problematic they are, right? And just by being like, look, it's there's a lot of people who can say, you guys are complicit with the state, you guys are ideologically problematic, you guys are anti-Muslim. But I wanted to actually like at the level of facts and footnotes and like you misidentified this person, like, you know, basically just, you know, show them how, like, at that level, how, how their project kind of falls apart. And then to quickly move on to, you know, telling the story that I wanted to tell. Um, and I, I think in, in many ways, what I want to encourage with a project like this is for, you know, folks working in Middle Eastern studies to try to move beyond that kind of like defensive post 9-11 crouch, right? The, the crouch of like, you know, like just reflexively pushing back against Islamophobia or like not all Muslims or whatever. And to say, look, we need to have um, more expansive uh, sort of vocabularies and political imaginations and, and, and conceptual frameworks for dealing with a lot of these issues, right? We can't just keep like beating the Samuel Huntington horse, right? Like there's a there's a bigger world of, um, of, of problems and challenges out there that we also want to be paying attention to. I think a hundred percent, like even though you do treat the terrorism industry as a speed bump, this is a corrective. And as you have pointed out multiple times, it's not only a corrective to the obviously, you know, kind of imperialist talkers, um, but it's also a corrective to um, those in critical Middle East studies who have been in a crouching defensive posture. Um, that said, Daryl, one of the things that crossed my mind as I was reading this is what audience, you know, how have audiences received it? What audience does this have? Because it goes beyond, right? It goes beyond that first question that people want to ask you. But religion is particular, right? It goes beyond that. And so I, it just, it gets to this level of what, how has it been received? Are you, are you happy with that reception? What do you wish? How do you hope for it to be hopefully a foundational um, stone for others to build on? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, if this conversation is like any sign, I think the reception has been great. I think there's been a lot of um, really fun and provocative conversations that have emerged from the book, but I share your concern. Like I didn't know who I was really writing this book for other than myself when I was writing it. And Good. I think like all texts, you know, it kind of builds its own audience and it's not clear how successful or how broad that audience is going to be because it's also pushing a lot of buttons or at least is trying to. And I, I don't know. I mean, I think this is, I think this is very much uh, to be determined. Um, I'm, you know, in some ways I'm like, the wrong kind of person to be writing the wrong kind of book at the wrong kind of time. But it may also actually end up being the right kind of person writing the right kind of book at the right kind of time. And, um, you know, I think only time will tell. 
Um, and, yeah. Um, and yeah, we'll see. But at least I, I tried to write something that um, was not what I have seen many, many iterations of. And whether it's different and successful because of it or different and fades into the ether um, is, you know, I guess we'll just see. I'm sorry if it sounded like I was suggesting you weren't going to have an audience, but it was particularly... Oh, no, 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 no. I have the same concern. <laughs> yeah, no, it was, it was particularly my, my reading of it and saying, this is unlike anything else. This is sui generis. It is its own, and it's, you know, it's almost out of this place. It's out, you, you have stepped outside of the conversation to shift, it, to, to insist on a paradigmatic shift, which they're, you know, not, I don't even think the scholars are necessarily ready for, but we need, Right. Audiences might not be necessarily ready for, but we need. And I and I love what you said about the fact that time will tell, because indeed, uh, the most significant texts are those that have uh, salience, even if not in that particular time, you know, as much. Then also later, because it lives on and, and proves itself to how relevant it is. And so I do see this as foundational, um, and I see it as so welcome, even as somebody who is is not foreign right to Middle East studies and to these conversations. It was fascinating to be drawn into an ethnography of 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 people's, you know, Mujahideen intimacies um on their own terms in a way that disrupts everything that I, it was hard because I didn't have I wasn't I didn't have the tools to put them anywhere. And so it was it was about surrender in order to to read it. So thank you for your work and congratulations. Well, thanks so much for this great conversation and for having me on. Anything else you want to say before we close? Um, no, that's it. Just thank you. And I hope for folks following this conversation who haven't read the book that they were, you know, that that it that it spoke to them in some way. And um, yeah, just, you know, thank you for, for this wonderful and brilliant engagement. Daryl, this marks the conclusion of the inaugural um, episode of the Transnational Times. Um, thank you so much for, for nothing else could have, could have, um, started us off. Um, and our next interview is with, with somebody who is a friend to both of us. It's going to be with Adon Gatachu. Um, nice. she'll be talking on black internationalism and the challenge to imperialism today on May 19th at 4 PM. Um, so thank you for, for kicking us off Daryl and, and congratulations again, if you haven't to the audience, this is the universal enemy. Jihad, Empire, and the Challenge of Solidarity. Thanks so much. Fini, <laughs>